Well, hi, my name is Mark. And I'm Jessica Coulter, and we're the pastors at the Valley Church in Troy. And we just want to say welcome to those who are watching us today online. Uh, we hope you have a great experience during our worship time and during the sermon. Uh, just a little bit about us as the Valley Church. We are a church, and one of our favorite sayings is this. We don't want to be a church that just sings and talks about the things of Jesus. We want to be a church that does the things Jesus told us to do. And so during this time, we've been reaching out, even though actually this past week, we've reached out to over a dozen nonprofits asking how we can help, and they've been letting us know we've been doing different things as a church partnering. And so we're pretty much saying yes to about anything people are bringing across to us to be able to be the light and make a difference in our community during this tough time. And we're also about families in the next generation. And one of the things we talk about is that when a kid graduates from high school or from college, we don't want them to graduate from their faith. And so families are also a priority. And there's a lot of ways that we're going to try to connect with families in May. So we'll be sharing that with you as well. Well, again, uh, we just hope you have a great experience with us. You can check us out at thevalley.church. That's our website, thevalley.church. We're on Facebook, The Valley Troy. We're on Instagram also, and we're on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, The Valley Troy. So we would love to, to have you check things out. And again, thank you so much for being with us today. Good morning. Welcome to The Valley. We're so glad you're with us this morning. This is going to be a time that we can stand in our living rooms and lift the name of the Lord.
I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me.
your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other i've known you as a father oh i've known you as a friend and i will sing in the goodness excited every time I sing this song because these aren't just lyrics and they're not just promises in the Bible because but they are but they are my testimony because he has led me through that fire I've known him as my father and I've known him as a friend and I'm here to show you this morning that I am a product my life is a product my family is a product of the goodness of God Wherever you are this morning, I just want you to know that God is good. He has plans for you beyond anything you could ever imagine. And what a sweet time that we can gather with our families around a computer or a TV and declare your goodness. Let's sing this chorus just one more time, wherever you are, maybe just stand in your living room, hold your babies close, and let's sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made for, oh, I will see. The goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. Welcome. We're so glad that you could be here with us today. We believe that life is meant to be done together and that together is better. Check out this video about our life groups on Zoom. Well, today I'm with uh, Missy Stone and she's going to be sharing her life group experience. So I think the first question, Missy, is uh, tell a little bit about the group that you're in right now. Yeah, sure. Well, hi, everybody. What we do is we Zoom every other Tuesday um, and basically we just talk about like what's been going on um in our lives during that time um sometimes we'll play like a fun game um 
And then of course we always share scripture and things like that. Um, and another thing that we started doing was following a Bible study together on the YouVersion Bible app. Well, cool. Um, what has been uh, really impactful for you by being in a life group, whether during this season or, or in the past, how's it made a big difference for you? I think one of the ways that's been the most helpful to me is because I just can get easily distracted with life. Um, and I'm sure that's not just me, but I just think it's very easy to get distracted with life in general. And I think that it becomes really easy to kind of put God on the back burner, um, so to speak. And so the thing that I love about the life group is that it's just a constant reminder to me um, of just uh, his promises and um, having people do the scriptures and um, just talking about the things that are going on in the Bible just helps me to keep him in the forefront of my mind. So when he's in the forefront of my mind and I'm always thinking about him, that is obviously just helping me to draw closer to him because the closer you are to him, you're going to start experiencing you know, the joy, the peace, um, patience, things like that. So. Yeah. I mean, that's spot on. That's what I hear from a lot of people who, who do life together with others. Um, so mm -hmm. let why should someone consider joining a life group? We're actually starting, uh, several new groups, even during this time, new leaders are saying they want to lead a group. And so, uh, we'll have different ways that you can, uh, sign up or, or show interest in that. But why should they take that step? Because it can be a big step for a lot of us to, to join into a group. The first one, very simple, is it's just fun. Um, you learn more about people and you become closer to them. And um, it's, that's just a neat thing to gain more friendship. The second thing I would say is it's easier now than ever to join a life group. I mean, you can basically do what we're doing now, hop on Zoom. You can be in the comfort of your own home. You could be wearing pajama bottoms and nobody would notice. <laughs> so it's just super easy. Um, but more seriously, I think people should consider joining because it really just helps you, I think, to be the best version of yourself. Because like I was saying, when you are closer to God, um, you are feeling more peaceful, joyful, um, more patience, and that just trickles down to the rest of your family. So it's kind of a win-win situation with that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that, that's so huge. I mean, we say at the Valley Church a lot that life is better together. Life is better together. We aren't designed to do it alone. We need other people. And I think during this time, more than ever, ever, it's showing that. It's proving that we need community. So if you're watching today and you aren't in a group, uh, you can go to our website, thevalley.church and check out our groups um, options. You can make a comment uh, while you're watching today, uh, and just say life group or interested in a life group and we will help you get connected. We don't want anyone to be alone ever, but especially during this time. So, so Missy, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. So we would love it if you could join a Zoom life group. It's a great way to stay connected. In fact, if you have the Bible app downloaded on your phone, it's free. We have an event in there. You can click on the link to get more information about joining a life group or the host that you're watching with online. will be posting that link. So you can click on that. Let us know if you've got interest and we will connect you with a life group that's happening on Zoom currently. We've also got a lot of other ways to connect online. We hope you can join us um, with the Bible app. There is a connect card. If you could fill out that virtual connect card, we would love to hear from you. There's a link to prayer requests, um, information about what's happening with teens and kids. So all of that information, including the text that Mark is speaking from today, will be listed in that event on the Bible app. And we also hope you can follow us online. On We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So we hope you can join us there. There are lots of things happening at the Valley Church.
Well, hello, Valley Church. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. It's uh, again great being with you. Uh, I would encourage you today, as you're watching this message, uh, interact with us. Uh, make some comments. Uh, you can even do some emojis, some thumbs up, some exclamation points, thumbs down. I don't care. Some of you might have way too much fun with the thumbs down, but I would love to see some interaction. Our hosts who are online will be uh, interacting with you, and I'll even have some stuff uh, throughout the message uh, of some questions or some statements that you can make some interactions with too. What well, is the third week of our series called Blueprints? And it, the whole idea is that God has a blueprint and his blueprint is best for marriage and for families. And so week one, we talked about the concept of oneness, that God's dream for a marriage is one thing, and it's oneness. And then last week, we talked about and looked at if a man becomes the chief servant in his marriage and the woman is the, uh, the wife is the chief cheerleader, we're pretty sure that that marriage is going to be awesome. Uh, and so I know even talking to some of you from last week, that's really challenged you, it's challenged me. And just to be authentic with you, to be real with you, uh, this series is a very humbling series. Uh, I'm just like you. Uh, I feel I fail as a husband more than I get it right. Today, as we talk about parenting, that's been incredibly humbling because I feel I fail more as a parent than I get it right. And here's the thing we know, you want to get it right. I want to get it right. And we at the Valley Church want to help you, and we believe that God's way is the best way to get it right. So we need to give each other grace, we need to give ourselves grace, but then we need to lead into the power of God through the Holy Spirit to be able to be effective husbands and wives and parents. Well, as we do talk about parenting today, we're gonna to go back to the book of Ephesians. We'll look at that in a second. But again, contextually, it's so important to understand that a father in the first century ruled the roost. And even as a, as a dad ruled the roost, and they had the authority to do whatever they wanted with their children. I mean, I'm talking even horrific things like throw them in the trash, get rid of them, um, hurt them. Uh, it, you can tell where I'm going. It, it, horrible, horrible stuff. Uh, and so knowing the context of kind of the man in that culture and their feelings towards their children, they were very aloof feeling-wise. There wasn't a much of an emotional attachment. When the Apostle Paul talks about these things that we're going to look at today in the book of Ephesians, this was radical. I'm going to say it again. This stuff was radical. They had never thought this way. They had never considered this. And he shows God's blueprint for how to be a good dad and how to be a good mom. And so with that in mind, and I would encourage you, if you are looking for a book to read in the Bible right now, Ephesians is a great one to dive into. That's where we've been throughout this. Next week, we'll continue and wrap this series up. But today we are going to be in Ephesians. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. In verse 4, so the verse is on the screen, uh, on your screens, uh, or you can turn to your Bible app. I know a lot of you are getting the Version Bible app on your phone or on your tablet. Uh, that's something that, that makes sure I don't miss reading the Bible. Uh, and so I know a lot of you are having great success with that too. But Ephesians chapter 6, 6 verse 4, he says the following, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And we're going to unpack this almost not word by word, but pretty, pretty close today as we look at this. Now, I do want you to understand, the father was the head of the household in that culture, so he's talking to fathers, but listeners or readers of this would have understood he's talking about moms and dads. He's talking about the role of both. So you can kind of put that in there. Fathers and mothers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training, etc. cetera. Uh, a little humorous story. A dad was with his two-year-old at the hardware store, and uh, she, her legs were getting tired, and so he put her up on his shoulders. And as they're going around, she started pulling on his hair. And eventually, he's like, stop it. Stop pulling on my hair. And uh, eventually, she just kept doing it. Of course, you know, dads have maybe have been through this before. He's getting annoyed, and he's like, stop it. Why are you pulling on my hair? And she said, but daddy, that's the only way I can get my gum back. <laughs> Now, some of you might not be laughing at that one because that happened to you, or mom, that happened to you, and you got a haircut that you maybe did not want to get. 
Uh, many of us could say that our children have exasperated us at one point. This would be a good time to interact. You could do a thumbs up, an exclamation point. I think whether they're young or whether they're teenagers, uh, we all as parents or grandparents, or maybe you don't have any kids in a home, but you can look back and remember, and we ourselves exasperated our parents. But I want you to know too that we can exasperate our children. And what happens? Well, how do we do that? Well, I think one way is when we don't keep our promises. That's a way we can exasperate our children. Another way is when we don't love and accept them unconditionally, right? And you even think of that. Some of you are listening today and that's why you feel exasperated. And it might have been 60 years ago when you were at home because you never felt unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. I've learned this, maybe you have too, the following statement you'll see on the screen, that rules without relationship equals what? Rebellion. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. Uh, I've seen this many times. Some of you maybe are still rebelling because you grew up in a home where it's more about rules and not about relationship. This is something that I always keep on my radar because it's so easy, even if you're not trying to become legalistic with your children, to focus in on the do's and the don'ts and forget to really pour into that relationship. Well, there's probably a ton of ways, maybe thousands of ways to exasperate and embitter our children, is or not. I came across this, uh, this statement or this kind of story by, by Gary Smalley, and he talked about kind of what happens as a result of this. I think he said it so well, I'm going to say what he said because of how well he said it. He said, I think when this happens and we exasperate, what we, what we do is we end up developing a closed spirit. Uh, and he said, our deepest relationships, our deepest personal relationships are on the spiritual level or on the spirit level. And in our relationship, either our spirit opens to another person or it closes off to another person. And what happens is, and I think many of you are probably even putting this in your mind right now, when we close off our spirit to another person, whether it be a spouse or to a parent or to just a, another person who's hurt us or wronged us, we create distance, right? We create separation. Uh, and a closed, a closed uh, spirit can become very, very poisonous, can it not? Uh, and in a parent-child relationship, this is, this is a deadly combination. Because what happens is, uh, it's natural for a child or a teen to argue and for there to be some back and forth and some disagreement, of course. What, what eventually happens is, if we get to the point where they close their spirit to us, or they close off to us, then they go to someone else. They go to another crowd, another group of friends who invite them in. They, may, they do self-destructive uh, things that uh, break their life down and, and cause you hurt too. And maybe as I'm explaining this today, some of you realize that you've closed off your spirit to another person. You've closed off your inner, inner being to someone else. And as a result of that, it led you down some destructive, uh, d destructive path as a result. This is something really personal to me. I remember uh, about 10 years ago, a counselor friend of mine that was just providing some coaching to me told me this statement, and I'll never forget it. He said, if I treat my children, I didn't have kids at that time, but if, I, if you treat your children with the same way I treat myself as far as being so hard on myself, he said, you will run them away from you. And as a dad now of a six-year-old and a three-year-old, those words at times have come back in my mind, especially when I've been getting on them about something and to the point where not just correcting them, but getting almost into the rules without the relationship. Uh, and when that happens, and even as I prepare this, I'm like, I'm, I could be closing off their inner self to me. And I don't want that. <laughs> that, that would break my heart. You don't want that either. So, so what do we do, okay? What's this all look? Well, well, everything that we do for our kids has to be through a relationship. Everything has to be through a relationship. In other words, we need to ask these questions. We need to know these things. What are they like? What are they struggling with? What are their dreams and hopes? What's discouraging them? What, what's encouraging them? Parents, have you had that conversation or those conversations with your kids lately? Have you talked about their dreams have you talked about what they're discouraged about or why they're discouraged or why they've been moping around a lot? Uh, have you had those conversations? Have you encouraged them? 
because it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. I have a group of men. There's, there's a group of men we meet uh, on Zoom every, every Saturday morning. And we do it. These are leaders and we do some accountability and we do some leadership training, reading some books and that kind of stuff. And a couple weeks ago, one of the challenges one of the guys in the group offered was, what is one thing you can do this week to make an input, if you will, into one of your children? And so we came back the following week and talked about the different things we did to establish that relationship, to deepen that relationship. And I shared with, with my six-year-old son, he's uh, big into mechanical things. He loves how things work, wants to know how they work, asks a million questions, or good questions. I'm not a mechanical guy. For me, uh, as long as it works, I'm good to go. If the car doesn't start, there's no series of steps I take other than calling like AAA. And so I did that week, I engaged in Dylan, his name, I did, engaged in Dylan's life. And we went on this little scavenger hunt for a while and looked at all these machines and talked about how they worked or I made up how I thought they worked uh, and just spent like about 90 minutes with him. And I'm telling you, as I walked out, as we rode our bikes back home from that, I thought, you know, could I have spent a better 90 minutes today? just spending time with him, engaging in his world, the things that are of interest to him, the things that kind of make him tick, the things that he loves to do. And he just knew that dad was there with him. So how do you do this? How, what are two ways to develop a relationship with our children? I think one is this, unconditional acceptance. We're not gonna agree with everything they do. Our parents, if you're a, a parent, that you didn't, uh, our parents didn't agree with everything we did or even close but you unconditionally accept them, that they know that you love them because they're your son. You love them because they're your daughter. And you're gonna be always in their corner. You're always gonna be rooting for them. Uh, they're gonna know when you disapprove of a decision they make or don't make, but unconditional acceptance. The other that I think shows our relationship, that develops a relationship with, with our children is this, the magic four letter word of time time. Uh, maybe you've heard it uh, said before, love is spelled T-I-M-E. That's something my own dad taught me really well. And now as a dad, I, I'm not near as good at time with my kids. I feel like I get too bogged into work and other stuff. But my dad would spend an inordinate amount of time with me, especially with baseball. I'm a baseball guy, played for quite a while. And in high school, we would uh, go hit for hours. I'm, I'm one of those guys, I just didn't take one round. We'd be out there for like two hours and I wanted to hit every day. I may or may not have uh, skipped my senior prom because I was in a little hitting slump and wanted to get some extra batting practice. Um, might explain why I didn't get married till I was in my early 30s, mid 30s. <laughs> but uh, my dad put time into me. He spent time with me. I honestly, no joke, I don't ever remember one instance when I said, dad, I want, let's go take some batting practice, let's go take some BP, then my dad said, no, I don't. I don't remember one time, and there were uh, hundreds, if not a thousand or more times that I asked him to go hit. Yeah, put that time in. Now let's look at the verse a little bit more here. The verse says, instead, instead of embittering them, instead of driving them away, instead of exasperating them, instead of doing that, do this, bring them up, in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, the word bring them up or the phrase bring them up literally means to nourish or replenish. To nourish or replenish. Think of it this way. I brought a little illustration with me. Very, I'm very uh, complex with illustrations. Think about nourishing and replenishing. This is what you do. Instead of taking deposits away from them, instead of taking withdrawals, away from them? What if you were making deposits? What if you were making uh, nourishment? That's what bring them up. Bring them up. Continue to pour into them. To continue to fill them up to overflowing, if you will. And then it says, of the Lord, of the Lord. Here's our goal. Our goal isn't to raise successful children who have great jobs and great marriages and great incomes and, and all that, which is important and, and we, want it. we want that for our kids, right? The fundamental goal, the number one goal is that they be of the Lord. If everything else fails, if everything else falls apart, if they're not great in their profession, if they don't have a lot of skills they bring to the table, if they have a deep loving relationship with Jesus Christ, you've been a success. 
you have been a success. And that's what we want. We want to raise a generation of difference makers for the kingdom. I look at my own kids, and sometimes when they're younger, I don't know if you do this, but you, you kind of picture what they might be later in life, you know, what, uh, what role they might have, what their job might be, and, you know, just based on their personality, some and interests. But I've been trying to think more about what would they look like? And I even pray this for them when I pray for them at night. What would their, what would their life look like if they are a revolutionary for God's kingdom, his expansion, his rule and reign in this world? Do you pray big prayers for them? Do you big, big, uh, dream big dreams for what God wants to do in and through their life? I would encourage you with that. One of the things we do at the Valley Church at a very young age when parents are ready for this is child dedication. Now, child dedication is essentially saying this. Parents, and it's not about bringing the kids up front, although that's, that's important, but it, parents are saying we are going to do everything within our power and then rely with everything in God's power to raise this kid right. Okay? That they would, we're going to dedicate them to God. We're going to give them back to God with the hope that they would be of the Lord. That they would be of the Lord. And so one of the things that popped into my mind recently was, hey, if you have not dedicated your child yet and you're interested in that as you're watching today, just put, make a comment in there. Say, hey, we're interested in child dedication. That we have a... Uh, a virtual connection card that you can click the link and fill that out too. Uh, just put child dedication or there's a box on the box on there to check or you can type it in there. But one way to be interactive, if you will, if that's something you've been mulling around in your mind or like, you know what, I want to take that formal step and say, we are going to publicly dedicate this child and say, he's yours, God. We're going to do everything with our strength and power and prayer to raise him or her uh, in a godly way. But then God, we're going to rely on you to do what only you can do. And I know we might be, not be doing dedications in person now, but we can take the class so you can go through the training and discipleship with that. So if that's you today, Mark, uh, mention that in the comment section. And we will follow up with you in the next couple of days and make sure we get you going, whether it's a Zoom group or something, something a one-on-one -on -one with Zoom, but we'll make sure that you get connected that way. See, Romans 6, 13 says this, and I love this. It says, because... The thing is, it's not just about the dedication of our children, but it's our dedication to the Lord. It says, do not let any part of your bodies become tools of wickedness to be used for sinning, but give yourselves completely to God. How much? Completely to God. And I love what the, this is a living Bible translation. It says, every part of you, <laughs> every single part of you, you want to be the tools in the hands of God to be used for his good purpose. We're not talking 50% in with God. We're not talking 75% or 90% in with God. The scripture is very clear. One of the best things you and I can do, maybe the best thing you and I can do for our children is to be 100% dedicated and committed to our spiritual growth and development. Saying yes to Jesus and then growing as a follower or disciple of his as you go. It was after the ded dedication of his baby brother in church, Jason sobbed all the way home in the backseat of the car. His father asked him three times, Jason, what's wrong? Jason, what's wrong? Why are you so upset? And finally, the boy replied, that pastor said he wanted us to be brought up in a Christian home. And I want to stay with you guys. Ouch. Now, I know you're all laughing. My humor is impeccable. But how many of us kind of laugh maybe uh, gingerly on that one. When push comes to shove, we act one way at one place, and then when you get inside and see everything, how it's going, it's maybe not quite different. You see, it's no surprise that the preceding passages in this section in, in Ephesians talked about marriage. Before he talked about what it means to be a parent, he talked about marriage. Why? Why jot this down? Because stability in a marriage means security, and security means confidence, and confidence means purpose. See, the, the best parents make their marriage relationship even more important or a higher priority than raising their kids. If your marriage is out of whack, you're not going to be able to raise your kids of the Lord. When your marriage is centered on Christ, when you individually are centered on Christ, and when your marriage is centered on Christ, look out. I came across this study, actually. It was a University of California study. It was a test of fifth and sixth graders 
and what caused them the highest degrees of sadness, anxiety, and depression? You might not be surprised with their top answers. Top answers were instability in their parents' marriage and parents who did not spend enough time with them. You see, the statistics are real, they're staggering, and they're sad. Now, so many of you are in different situations today as you're watching. Some of you are in first marriages. Some of you are in second marriages. Some of you are single moms. And I mean, I, you are heroes, <laughs> you single moms. Some of you are single dads. I mean, what a job. What an intense job, especially during this time of trying to do everything. Some of you have been divorced. Uh, and here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage all of you, no matter what stage of life you're in. Maybe you're not married yet. Maybe you're widowed and have grandchildren. I want to encourage you with this. Stay true to Christ. Lean into that relationship like no other. Don't give up on that. I want to leave you with this scripture as I kind of wrap up today. It's in Psalm 62, and I love this psalm. It says this. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, that you, O God, are strong and that you, O Lord, are loving. Surely you reward each person according to what he has done. That's actually my prayer for each of you today. That you would model the best as you can to be a strong mom or dad, strong in Christ, and that you would model as best as you can through only, and the only way we do this is through God's spirit, through God's power working in us, that you would model as well as you can to be a loving mom and dad to your kids. I'll close with this. You're not alone. I think so many of us, feel that we're on an island, that we feel we're alone in this. God's going to supply everything you need. God wants your marriage and he wants your children and how you raise your children to be more successful and for you to be more successful than you could ever dream on your most wild dream day about success. But it's going to take us leaning into our relationship with Christ. It's a spending time in God's word. It's one of the things I always remember. My dad, I never saw him read any other book in my life except the Bible and his devotional book. And seeing my parents tithe check that they were going to give the first 10% back to the church and back to God. Those are the things that are indelible marks that you leave in your kids. That relationship with Christ, that steadfastness, that we are going to be a, a household, that we're going to have one big rock, and that rock is going to be Jesus. And that's what we're going to make decisions on. That's how we're going to filter through how we view things. That's how we're going to parent. That's the legacy that we want to leave is a kid who follows Christ all the days of their life. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like a bumbling idiot when it comes to my parenting skills. I feel inadequate. I feel unequipped. I don't feel like I measure up. I don't feel like I get it right more times than not. And my encouragement to myself and to you is don't get down. Don't get down on yourself. Rather, refocus and take the next right step. And start that today. Take the next best right step today. Here's my challenge for all of you this week. If your parents or grandparents, or maybe you don't have kids, you could, uh, someone that's in, uh, that's in the ministry you're, you oversee, if you're in elementary ministry or kids ministry, or maybe it's a kid in the neighborhood, The challenge is this. I want you to do one specific thing to build into your relationship with your children. You can pick one child if you have multiple. Maybe the husband takes one and the wife takes another. But one specific thing that you're going to do this week to build, to make an input, to fill up, to overflow your child. Before I pray today, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Here's why. If you don't have Jesus leading your life, there's no way your marriage is ever going to be what God intended to be. And I think it's why some of you never feel like you can figure out how to best raise your child. You're lost. Now, here's what it means to accept Christ. It means you recognize that your sin broke the relationship. That sin was such a big deal to God. It's disobeying God, God's rule and his, his, his commands, that Jesus had to go die on a cross. 
The only way you and I could be made right with God was through Jesus being the perfect sacrifice. That's the seriousness of sin, folks. And when you have that realization, like I've had and countless others have, that you know that you know, number one, that you're not in a right relationship with God. Number two, that if your life were to end today, that you're going to be separated from God for all eternity. All eternity. Hell's a real place. Don't let anyone deceive you. It's a real place. And you have that moment where you repent, change your heart, change your mind, and you seek forgiveness. And you say, God, please forgive me. I recognize my sin broke the relationship. I want to be in right relationship with you. God, would you come in? Would your forgiveness flood over me? Would your grace, that undeserved favor, would it take over me? And so if that's you today, I'm going to pray for you. But if you made that commitment to Christ today, I want you to shoot me an email. My email will come up on there. You can make mention on our virtual connection card, check, made a decision for Christ. We want to help you in that journey. We're going to follow up. We want to get you connected with a mentor. We can still do that through through technology right now. This is a a vital, important decision. Are you going to make that decision today? Some of you have been running away and running away from Christ, and today is the day to run to him. Let's pray. Father, I pray for anyone right now who's watching or listening, and they know that they know, whether they're in their bedroom or whether they're in their car or whether they're in their living room or whether they have listening to this as they're at, out for a walk, they know that they know that they are not right with Jesus. They are not right with God. I pray that today they would acknowledge their sin. They would pray. They would pray as God even leads them, but they would essentially pray that they would repent of their sin. They would ask for forgiveness. They would ask God to come in and be the, the savior for them and to be the leader of their life and that they would turn their life over to him, and they would live every day the best as they know how with him in control. They would give over control of their life to him and quit holding on to what they're holding on to. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that today, the Bible says that you are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. Well, I want to thank you for joining us again today. It's been a blessing as we continue this series. Next week's going to be really exciting. Next week, we wrap up the series, and my wife, Jessica, and I, we are going to come, and we're going to team teach together, and we're going to be talking about conflict in marriage and how do you get through that, how do you overcome that. And so you're going to get invited into our life and even into our conflicts and how we've resolved them and how we failed at those two. And so I'd encourage you to watch. I think you're going to Uh, enjoy it, but also be really challenged to see how God can work in and through that. Uh, Have a great week. Continue to follow us on uh, Facebook and on Instagram and our YouTube page. We'll see you next week. Be blessed.